Good afternoon and welcome. It's great to see so many of you out here this afternoon. My name is Teresa ladrigan Welpley, and I serve as the director of the Bannon Institutes in the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara. The work of the Ignatian Center is to further Santa Clara's distinctively Jesuit Catholic tradition of education by providing leadership for the integration of faith, justice, and the intellectual life on our campus and in the larger community. And one of the ways in which we seek to actualize this mission and vision is through the work of our Bannon Institutes, which hosts interdisciplinary faculty collaboratives, a podcast series, and public lectures and dialogues such as this, this afternoon. Through thematic initiatives and offerings, the Bannon Institute seeks to serve as a mission catalyst, leveraging the resources of the university as a transformative social force building a more humane, just, and sustainable world. The 2016-18 Bannon Institute theme is framed around the question and call, is there a common good in our common home, a summons to solidarity? Pope Francis, in his encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home, argues that the common good must be understood as a practice of solidarity, a practice by which we come to know and value the full and innate dignity of every human person, every dimension of the natural world, and to seek to share our diverse goods freely with one another for mutual benefit, for the benefit of all creation. Pope Francis writes, in the present condition of global society, where injustices abound and growing numbers of people are deprived of basic human rights and considered expendable. The principle of the common good immediately becomes, logically and inevitably, a summons to solidarity. We open this 2016-18 Bannon Institute today in the thick of the election season, where divisive rhetoric polarized communities, and social violence have marked our political and public landscape. The question, is there a common good in our common home, presses in on us with utmost urgency. Over the next four weeks leading up to Election Day, you're invited to join us for, the, for a four-part series engaging what's at stake for the common good in 2016. We hope that you can come and critically reflect on issues of racial and ethnic justice, environmental justice, economic justice, and gender justice facing our nation and our world today. Father Brian Massingale, a Catholic ethicist and author of Racial Justice in the Catholic Church, notes that whether explicit or implicit, virtually every social challenge facing the United States, education, care for the environment, access to health care, poverty, immigration reform, criminal justice, is entangled with or aggravated by racial bias against people of color. In the last several years, as the death litany of Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, Philandro Castillo, Alfred Olango, and many more have continued to grow, Academics and activists alike have highlighted the ways in which mass criminalization and mass incarceration disproportionately impact African American and Latino populations. Calls for comprehensive immigration reform and criminal justice reform have risen from the political stage, as have incendiary, often coded racial language and privilege. Pursuing racial and ethnic justice in 2016 requires the critique of structured patterns of racial privilege and systemic racial injustice that adversely impact all of us in the United States and beyond. Pursuing the common good requires us to acknowledge and dismantle what ethicist David Hollenbach terms common bad. Although the Catholic Church has itself often fallen short, Catholic social teaching possesses extraordinary resources for this critical work of racial and ethnic justice. The Catholic social tradition advances an understanding of distributive justice, 
that requires social harms to be apportioned in such a way as not to burden those members of the community least able to bear them. It provides a sophisticated understanding of social sin, which recognizes that sin becomes embodied in public life and social institutions. It advocates a view of the gospel that entails a stance of solidarity and a commitment to the poor, dispossessed, and socially vulnerable. And yet, as Massingale, Hollenbach, and others reflect, there has been serious obstacles to a forthright engagement with issues of racial privilege and implicit and explicit racial and ethnic injustice in the United States and in the Catholic Church. Because, and as, the, as Massingale says, quote, we don't know what we're talking about, we don't know how to talk about it, and we don't really want to talk about it. So our hope today is to talk about it, asking what is at stake for racial and ethnic justice in 2016. We're privileged to be joined by a distinguished panel of scholars in education, ethnic studies and history, rhetoric, and social ethics for today's event. All members of the 2016-18 Bannon Institute Collaborative on Racial and Ethnic Justice and the Common Good. Dr. Brett Johnson Solomon, Associate Professor in the Child Studies Program and Interim Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion at Santa Clara, chairs the Bannon Institute Faculty Collaborative on Racial and Ethnic Justice and the Common Good and will facilitate today's dialogue. Her own work centers on implicit bias among elementary school teachers, examining the implica implications for the preschool to prison pipeline. Dr. Solomon earned her degrees from UC Berkeley Harvard and UCLA and has served as the director of the Future Teachers Project at Santa Clara, whose mission is to recruit, support, and mentor students of color pursuing teaching careers in urban and underserved schools. Prior to coming to Santa Clara, Dr. Solomon had a decade of administrative experience in community service organizations serving children and youth. She's the co-founder and first executive director of the former Girls Incorporated of San Mateo County and was an educational consultant for the Life Learning Academy, the Delancey Street Foundation's charter high school, serving delinquent and dependent students. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Solomon, who will introduce the contributors for today's event and facilitate the dialogue with our distinguished panel. Dr. Solomon. Thank you, Teresa. And welcome, everybody, to the first event of the Bannon Institute. Let's give Bannon Institute a round of applause. We've worked very hard to get to this point, so we're so excited that we're here. So I'm really honored not only to be here um, and the faculty facilitator fellow for, let's get to the right slide. Um, what's at stake for racial and ethnic justice in 2016, but I'm really, really excited to introduce you to our wonderful, wonderful faculty seminar scholars, two of which are not on our panel today, and I'm going to start by introducing who they are. So you know who we are and have an idea about um, some of the things that we're going to be rolling out over the next 24 months. So Margaret Russell is um, our first seminar scholar. She's a professor in the School of Law and she's a Bannon Institute scholar in the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at SCU. She's affiliated with the University's Center for Social Justice and Public Service, the Markala Center for Applied Ethics um, as well. In 1991, Margaret traveled to South Africa with a delegation of legal scholars to provide consultation on constitution drafting for post-apartheid transition. She is currently on sabbatical at Northeastern University and recently participated in a Capitol Hill briefing on the renewal of the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act, which was very powerful. Her seminar initiative is Truth Commission's The Right to Truth and Racial Justice in the United States. 
Our next seminar scholar is Shen Yi Chang. Shen Yi, you are here. Where are you? Yay! <laughs> Shen Yi is an associate professor in the Department of Communication, and she's also a Bannon Institute Scholar in the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at SCU. Her research interests cross boundaries of communication, immigration, and globalization from critical and qualitative perspectives. Her book, Cultural Interface, investigates experiences of a Chinese and Taiwanese community on the U.S.-Mexico border from a critical communication perspective. Her seminar initiative is Relational Citizenship in Racial and Ethnic Justice. So now I'm going to introduce our scholars who are going to join us on the panel today. Anthony Hazard is an assistant professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies with courtesy appointment in the Department of History and a Bannon Institute scholar in the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education at Santa Clara University. His research and teaching focus on 20th century transnational U.S. history, the history of anthropology, and race and racism. Professor Hazard's book, Post-War Anti-Racism, the U.S., UNESCO, and Race, 1945 to 1968, explores the discourse and practice of anti-racism in the first two decades following World War II. His seminar initiative is Bosnians at War, Anthropology, Race, and World War II. Join me in welcoming Anthony Hazard. Our next seminar scholar, Cruz Medina, is an assistant professor of rhetoric and composition in the Department of English and Bannon Institute Scholar for the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education at SCU. Professor Medina's research and teaching addresses, oops, let's go back, um, addresses digital writing and multicultural rhetoric focusing on issues of social justice. His book, Reclaiming Pacho, Pop, Examining the Rhetoric of Cultural Deficiency, addresses issues of citizenship, education, and politics related to Latinas, Latinx, in the United States. His seminar initiative is Strangers, Strangers Who Sojourn, Social Media and the Common Good in the Silicon Valley. Cruz Medina. <laughs> Our next seminar scholar is Father William O'Neill, and he is a member of the Society of Jesus and an associate professor of social ethics at the Jesuit School of Theology and Bannon Institute scholar in the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education at SCU. His writings address questions of human rights, ethics, and hermeneutical theory, social reconciliation, and conflict resolution, excuse me, and refugee policy. His most recent publication is First to be Reconciled, Restorative Justice and Deliberative Democracy. His seminar initiative is First to be Reconciled, The Common Good and Restorative Justice. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Bill. I know you all are ready to get started. <laughs> I can't breathe. He said it eight times as he was restrained on the ground by several officers. Get away. For what? Every time you see me, you want to mess with me. I'm tired of it. It stops today. Why would you? Everyone standing here will tell you I didn't do nothing. I didn't sell nothing because every time you see me, you want to harass me. You want to stop me selling cigarettes. I'm minding my business, officer. I'm minding my business. Please, just leave me alone. I told you last time, please, just leave me alone. Please, please, don't touch me. Don't touch me. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. 
I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. So what is at stake for racial and ethnic justice in 2016? Are we stronger together? And what does it mean to make America great again? Racialized police violence and criminal justice have certainly been a hot topic throughout the campaign season. But what is at stake for racial and ethnic justice? And it doesn't just stop right here. We've seen a campaign racialize and demonize entire groups of people. We've heard support for reintroducing the practice of stop and frisk, which we know is unconstitutional because it unfairly profiles black and brown people. Presidential supporters have been characterized as deplorables. We've listened to ideas about one's ability or inability to execute their job because of their racial heritage. We've heard about a wall. We've listened to claims that our first African American president is in fact not American. We've been reminded of the term super predator. And since last night, that Mexican thing has been trending on Twitter as a result of the vice presidential debate. During the same debate, implicit bias was passed off as a joke for what's at stake for racial and it was passed off as a joke. So what is at stake for racial and ethnic justice in 2016? And what are the implications of making America great again or being stronger together? What implications do those slogans have on racial and ethnic justice for the common good? So I'd like to open our dialogue today around the framing of the campaigns for the two major party nominees. Donald Trump's campaign is framed around the promise to make America great again. Hillary Clinton's campaign is framed, framed around the adage, stronger together. How do each of these campaigns reflect their candidates, candidates' vision for what, excuse me, American democracy and society should look like? And how are Trump and Clinton grappling in their campaigns with the long history of racialization that has been central to American society and politics? Sure, uh, I'll jump right in. So it seems to me that with the Clinton campaign, um, there is this kind of embrace of inclusivity, uh, even if we're just talking at, at this point about rhetorical positions, right? Um, there's even been statements made by the candidate herself uh, regarding the strength of America, of the United States of America being tied to the diversity that, that exists within the country. Um, so I think it's, it's fairly clear, right, that we're getting a sense of the Clinton campaign embracing diversity and inclusion. On the other hand, with the Trump campaign, um, as Brett mentioned, there's been a lot of discussion of building a literal physical wall, right, of banning, even if temporarily, um, immigration from certain parts of the world. And again, it seems fairly clear to me that a central element of the Trump campaign is actually exclusion, right, based on religion, based on ethnicity. If we stick to the concept of, of biological races, right, based on race then. Um, so I think there are two very different visions there for American democracy and society moving forward. Um, to the second part of the question, right, in terms of how each campaign is grappling with the history of race and racism, right, and race making. I think Hillary Clinton has done two very important things. First, she's actually acknowledged her own privilege as a white person in this country. And that's, to me, very important. The second thing I think Hillary Clinton has done uh, is 
acknowledge the existence, right, the ongoing existence of systemic racism. She's actually stated that, and it's, it's so key, right, to have someone on the cusp of becoming president of the United States on the heels of the first black president, right, to acknowledge that systemic racism still exists in the 21st century. In terms of the Trump campaign, it's been documented that the Trump campaign has appealed to and successfully embraced elements of the alt-right, right? We're talking the right, right, right wing. <laughs> um, that's clear, it's been documented. And so what we see there, and I think this is actually kind of fascinating, um, we see Donald Trump and his campaign grappling with this history of racialization by appealing to a nationalism that's based on a notion of whiteness, right? I think that's fascinating and it's worked, right? He's this close from becoming president, so it's worked. And so I think both campaigns are grappling with that history of race and racism and the process of race making, um, but certainly to different ends, right? To different ends. Yeah, and I think I wanted to add the idea sort of of making America great again does seem very persuasive, I think, for a lot of audiences because it really does sort of play on that idea, that trope, mm -hmm. belief in the American dream. And so, of course, it, it seems he's very directing that audience, audience to a very narrow audience in terms of who he's going to include in that, to get at that idea of being exclusionary, I think, that... That's a good point. Part of my research that I've done is working with Latin American immigrants in Oakland, and a lot of time that discussion, one of the things I did pointedly ask is, you know, do you still believe in the American dream, and what are your thoughts about the American dream? And a lot of them say, like, we readily admit that it is difficult, and it's much more difficult than we ever thought it could be to be in this country. However, we still very much believe in that American dream. And so I think it's really interesting, though, or really unfortunate, I should say, I think, thinking about what is at stake in the future, how more often than not the candidate Trump seems to uh, use this language of exclusion that seems to make this American dream seem appealing once again for only an exclusive group of Americans, so. How do you think, um, how do you think that racial and ethnic minorities feel about, as far as value, the acknowledgement um, of um, the challenges that they've had. I know, Tony, you touched on. Right. It's important that right. Hillary Clinton not only acknowledge her privilege, yes. but she also <laughs> acknowledges the realities that um, many racial and ethnic minorities are faced with. Sure. I, I, it seems to me, um, and this evidence is part anecdotal, right, part um, published, um, in New York Times, Los Angeles Times, so on and so forth. But uh, it's resonating, right, with, with people of color, in particular African Americans, and we're in a particular historical moment in which, in which more of the country is actually finally seeing what black people experience on a daily basis due to social media. Certainly um, apps, right, there are now apps that you can install on your phone to record, right, to document um, these incidences with law enforcement. And so more of the country is now seeing what black people have been saying for 400 years. Uh, and so to have Hillary Clinton acknowledge what we've known, what some of us have known for decades and centuries even, I think is, is really resonating with people. Thank you. So Mr. Trump's popularity heightened when he challenged President Obama le Obama's legitimacy with attacks on his birth certificate, which relied on implicit assumptions around citizenship and race. Trump has also characterized Me Mexican immigrants as rapists, drug dealers, and criminals, and proposed an immigration ban on Muslims. Hillary Clinton has recently commented that half of all Trump supporters are deplorables. How are issues of race, ethnicity, and citizenship driving American politics today? And what are the implications for American democracy 
and for the advancement um, of the common good. Did I just read the first question? Okay. Sounds good. Well, I'm really excited to answer that long question because I'm in English, so I, I love anytime we start talking about the use of language, as offensive as it may be, I think that's a good place to start jumping into it. However, I think uh, speaking from the, the being someone who studies rhetoric too, I can tell you sort of the the use of rhetoric and the attack on citizenship is something that goes back to the Greco-Roman era, essentially. Sort of the word nerd thing is like, if you look at barbarian, like the root of barbarian literally meant someone who doesn't speak Greek. So literally it was just another way to uh, exclude a particular group and sort of vilify the other. So once again, when we're looking at, uh, you know, Trump, we could say that you know, he's really good at employing these sort of uh, quote unquote mean girl stati uh, strategies of excluding certain groups at the same time when we're thinking about what this means when we're, and he's attacking the first African American president, you know, that question becomes so much more, has so much more weight that it brings with it. So once again, I think to the fact that he's sort of asking this question or we're thinking about this gets at this argument which sort of operates under this assumption that, you know, you can only really be white if, or only really be uh, American if you're white, which is, I mm -hmm. think, something that you touched on in terms of inclusion and what it really can mean. Um, so to get back at sort of this question, too, of sort of using language and looking at it, uh, part of the work I do is looking at how sort of racism sometimes circulates within social media. You know, as, as Professor Howard said, this is one of these places where we're beginning to actually see the experiences of our people communicated through these media. And one of the uh, sort of more alarming or sort of salient aspects that we see in like the racist responses to the first uh, Indian American Miss America and the young man who was singing the national anthem in the mariachi outfit, and then even the Coca-Cola uh, Coca Super Bowl commercial for America the Beautiful that was in multiple languages, that a lot of these racist uh, eruptions happened when this idea of the English-speaking white ideal is challenged. And so what's dis uh, unfortunate, though, is we don't really see that sort of happening when uh, candidate Trump is sort of using a lot of this language from his supporters. His, his supporters mm -hmm. seem willing to be complicit in this belief where I think you, uh, Professor Howard has it brought up the, uh, the argument that, uh, you know, they're, they're much more willing to be complicit in this idea of nationalism mm -hmm. and whiteness really being purposefully conflated together. So I think that's something. To get back at this idea of, of language, though, too, I just wanted to touch on you know, it's like I, I teach a lot of first year English. I don't know if I have any of my students here today. Um, but one of those things that we're always sort of emphasizing is like how important the use of language is and understanding using it correctly and appropriately in particular contexts and how much power really circulates through this use of language. So to get back at how the other night, uh, I think uh, Cain asked Pence, you know, about to defend sort of Trump's use of, you know, rapists and calling everybody mm -hmm. criminals and sort of categorizing or painting a lot of uh, Mexican immigrants with this really broad brush. And of course, we said the as as uh, as Brett mentioned, you know, the sort of dismissed as oh that Mexican thing again, right? And that really gets at to this real dismissal and this cynical use of sort of language. And I would say an abuse of power to be able to say that we don't have to acknowledge this discussion or moving on from it because it's really not deeming important to us. So I think uh, that is extremely important when we're thinking about what is at stake. Thank you. Tony, I think that's right on the mark. We really are embroiled in the politics and polemics of exclusion. Uh, and I think that the slogan, Make America Great Again, at least for many, is not so thinly veiled appeal to uh, keep America white. Uh, but I think we can imagine otherwise. And I, I think back to 1970 when the great author Ralph Ellison wrote, he said, despite his racial difference and social status, something indisputably American about Negroes not only raised doubts about the white man's value system, but arouse the troubling suspicion that whatever else the true American is, he's also black. I think we don't have two separate segregated histories, one white and one black. There's a single narrative 
as Dr. King reminded us, linking our destinies. It's a common history. And I think as, as both uh, Cruz and Tony have said, if the original sin of our country is racism, perpetuated in Jim, uh, Jim Crow and racial exclusion, there's also an original blessing. And that's the history of black resistance. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that there can be no redemption for our country and no greatness of this country until black lives matter. It's because black lives matter that our country is great. Uh, and if we want to speak about greatness, I'm thinking of uh, when Pope Francis visited this country. Whom did he signal out for Catholics to imitate? Lincoln, but Martin Luther King, the Baptist preacher. And then, and then three folks who were involved in nonviolent opposition to racism. And Francis himself has said, racism is the greatest evil of our time. Uh, so I think before us, as the prophets say, is blessing and curse. And we really are invited to choose blessing, choose life. Mm -hmm. What do you think, this is for anyone, what do you think about um, Trump's um, <clears throat> attempts to build bridges um, with the African-American communities, mm -hmm. going to the African-American churches, and then leaving um, the, those venues and saying, oh, the blacks love me, or I'm not directly quoting him, or, or I'm going to get you know, such a great percentage of their, of their votes. Like, what are your, um, you know, based off of your comments, based off of rhetoric and language, um, what, do you, what do you make of that? What are your thoughts? Well, I, have, I have a simple, quick response. I can jump in once again, channeling my English teacher. That I, one of the things I always talk about, you know, one of the things we're always looking at, we talk about with the research is, you know, you're making these claims, but then what evidence do you have to really back them up, right? In order to get into this, you know, deeper nuance of analysis we want to, in order to convey our argument. So I think oftentimes we have to, you know, really distinguish between these sort of self-aggrandizing, self-promotional sort of claims that seem very cyclical in their logic and separate between, you know, what actually has support. And, you know, I think that was the, the, the strange uh, attack on, on Clinton was that, you know, she seemed a little too prepared for the uh, debate. And it's sort of like, okay, that, that could be one way of going about it. It's like she had evidence, like that was, okay, that's a strange criticism. So that's just my natural first response to that question. I think with, with um, this issue, and it's, it's kind of arisen late in the game, right, with Trump making these overtures uh, to African Americans, and I wouldn't say the African American community as he has uh, African American communities, uh, what we've seen in, in the polls is that Trump started out, I believe, around 1% of African American registered voters. The highest number I've seen is 5%. So in practical terms, it's not working. Um, and more than that, when you are a candidate for president of the United States and you're holding a rally and you point to one African American person who may be there and call him mm. my African American, mm. right? People can see directly through these overtures to the African American community. Um, and, and to add, Trump has described African Americans as living in the inner city, their schools are bad, they have no jobs, Right, so it's this, it's this really um, reductionist view of African American life, and so again, it, it it would be a feat, right, for Trump to actually increase his support. I think among African American voters. Thank you. Um, okay, let's move on. We want to have time for questions, also. Um, the sentencing project notes that the criminal justice system's high volume of contact with people of color is a major cause of African Americans' disproportionate rate of fatal police encounters, as well as of broader perceptions of injustice in many communities. What's at stake for criminal justice reform within American democracy, and how are Clinton and Trump responding? What are the social and ethical implications of mass incarceration 
as in Michelle Alexander's world, words, the new Jim Crow. Thanks, Brett. We heard the litany of black lives lost, uh, brown lives lost. And I want to say a word just of closely, about a closely related phenomenon, that is the, the mass incarceration of so many of our sisters and brothers in the name of impartial criminal justice. And Michelle Alexander writes in her powerful book, uh, she speaks of a new Jim Crow, that the myth of impartiality before the law absolves us really of history. And consider that according to the most recent data we have, today in the US we are incarcerating more people absolutely than any other country in the world. About 2.2 million people. It's the highest official rate. And if we include those on probation or parole, the number comes to almost 7 million. And then if we disaggregate for race, ethnicity, one in every 13 black males between 30 and 34 is in prison. 38% of inmates in federal prisons were blacks. In 2011, the most recent rate uh, data we have, the incarceration rate for black women was 2.5 times higher than the rate for white women. Felony disenfranchisement deprives one of every 13 African Americans of the very right to vote of their citizenship. And one in nine African American children have a parent who was incarcerated. So Michelle Alexander speaks of this as the new Jim Crow of racial caste and racialized social control Adam Gopchik writes, and I quote here, he says, mass incarceration on a scale almost unexampled in human history is a fundamental fact of our country today. As slavery was the fundamental fact in 1850. In truth, he says, there are more black men in the grip of the criminal justice system than were in slavery then. The great political theorist Han Arendt once spoke of refugees, of those who are aliens, as frightening symbols of difference as such. And I think for us today that the racialization of black bodies has created this sense of frightening symbols of difference. And so we punish what we fear and we fear what we punish, perpetuating this dialectic of erasure of black bodies and black lives from our history. Difference is feared and punished and we produce the very differences then we fear. Um, and so what looks like an impartial criminal justice system, in fact, rationalizes, and I say erases, the partiality and racial bias. It is so much a part of our life today. Briefly, uh, Hillary, I think, has raised the right questions. And I think, as both of my colleagues are all have said, it took courage to speak about systemic racism and implicit bias. Um, her appeals are correct in addressing the problems of federally mandated minimum sentences in which so many persons in our country are locked up for year after year after year, often for nonviolent crimes or felonies. To address the privatization of, privilege, of prisons, as we often say, you know, crime doesn't pay, but punishment does. It does. And she's promised to address this, not at the federal, but to encourage the state level of abolishing of private prisons as well. Uh, the work of community policing, uh, reintegration of those who have been imprisoned into societies. Uh, a number of her proposals uh, I, I think are right on the mark. On the other hand, as we've seen, uh, the racial profiling, uh, so much at play in stop and frisk, is not a solution. It has not been proven to work. Even in New York, the crime has gone down at a greater rate after stop and frisk, I believe. Uh, so we have a kind of misplaced rhetoric of law and order. But as Martin Luther King reminded us, true law is founded on justice, on the common good, and the promise of a beloved community. And I really think uh, our, our project on the common good is inviting us to reimagine our world, and I think we could begin with the reality of mass incarceration. I'll add that, that although Hillary Clinton has currently um, articulated certain proposals to address mass incarceration, uh, to end uh, police brutality, right, to address police um, profiling, racial profiling. It's, it, there's still going to be at stake if, in fact, she wins um, for African American and other people of color to hold her accountable yeah. as president, right? To win and to get in the White House is one thing, Right, and to, as a candidate, articulate these positions that really look good and sound good 
that's one thing, right? A, a policy proposal isn't necessarily going right. to save someone's life, right. right? So I think as, as, as voters, as citizens, if in fact Hillary Clinton wins, we need to maintain pressure, political pressure, those of us who are activists, and we need to hold her accountable, right, for these policy proposals. And uh, we'll see if, mm -hmm. in fact, that is the case. Uh, we'll see what happens. But I think that's really important to keep in mind moving forward. Yeah, yeah and I want to add to that also um, a lot of the work that I do has to do with implicit bias in the classroom. And when we talk about the criminal justice system and the overrepresentation of people of color and the criminal justice system, where does that start? And this notion of the school to prison pipeline and what does that mean? And why is there even a notion like the fact that, you know, it even exists that there's a school to prison pipeline um, is something that we, we certainly have to be mindful of and, um, you know, take, take very seriously and um, approach it um, with a very intentional framework. Um, kids are getting pushed out of school. Um, black and brown kids are getting pushed out of school over twice as much as um, white kids are getting pushed out of school for the same issue, not crime, but the same issue. And what happens is once these kids get pushed out of school, um, the more frequently they get pushed out of school, the more likely they are to drop out of school. Okay. And there have been studies that have been done on kids as young as preschool, <clears throat> African American kids in preschool that have gotten kicked out of preschool. Now I know I have a little one who's not so far out of preschool, and um, some of the the um, issues that kids are were getting kicked out of preschool. I think like all kids mm -hmm. who are in preschool yeah. throw things, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like part of their job. Um, it's part of what part of what we expect, you know. But you know, our kids are being held to higher, um, stricter um, zero tolerance standards um, as part of their developmental process. Another thing that we really need to think about is cultural competence um, for teachers, so that they really have a broader understanding and awareness of who their kids are and why is this kid coming in late, mm -hmm. or why is this kid falling asleep in my class. And they're um, punishing the behavior, but mm -hmm. the behavior is a symptom of something else. So mm -hmm. maybe they're coming in late because there's no parent at home and they're taking care of their siblings and making mm -hmm. sure they get to school on time. Um, or maybe they're falling asleep um, in the middle of class because they stayed up late because they're taking care of their household or they're mm -hmm. taking care of their parent or an ailing, mm -hmm family member, and I think it really does start with relationships um, and individuals who are in a position to um, really affect change with individuals, um, establishing relationships and understanding what individuals are going through, and especially children, our most vulnerable population, our kids, who are we raising, you know? And what are, what are we exposing them to now? Even with this campaign, I don't even mm -hmm. want my kids to watch, yeah. um, you know, to, to see what's going on and because it's, it's not the image that we um, would want um, to portray as a president, but I'm digressing a little bit. Um, but part of what I think it is that we need to consider is cultural competency, not just for teachers, but for mm -hmm. all of us. Um, police officers as well, and it mm -hmm. starts with reaching out. Starts with reaching out. Okay, so let me make sure we're doing well for time. Okay, so I have one final question, and then we will open it up for questions. And this is for um, for anyone on the panel. Mm -hmm. So the overarching framework of the Bannon Institute this year is contained in the question and call: Is there a common good in our common home? the summons to solidarity. Um, Santa Clara University, as a Jesuit Catholic university, um, seeks to form students to be leaders of competence, conscience, and compassion to build a more humane, just, and sustainable world. What do you see 
my esteemed colleagues, um, as the role of a Jesuit Catholic university like Santa Clara in advancing racial and ethnic justice and the common good? And what does it mean for each of you in your teaching research service? Loaded question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, so, and this relates directly to, to my teaching and being faculty in ethnic studies and history. Um, a large task of mine is to expose our students to kind of the underbelly of American history, which means exploring some of the really ugly stuff, which happens to just be true, right? When we talk about the institution of chattel slavery, when mm -hmm. we talk about the transition through the period of Reconstruction and how that ended and why it ended, and then moving into to Jim Crow, um, you know, students need to understand that people of African descent have were enslaved in this country longer than they have been free, right? So it's looking at facts and then attempting to analyze them and bringing that forward and asking serious questions about why we are where we are today, right? Um, and I think a part of what Santa Clara could do, could consider, um, would be to kind of expand the core curriculum mm -hmm. requirements mm -hmm. as opposed to one, one class dealing with diversity, maybe two or three, right? Uh, I think that would be useful for faculty and students. Um, and in addition to that, I think it's continuing to allow the faculty the freedom, right, to challenge our students, to, to send out graduating seniors who have been educated as a whole person, right? I, I would agree very much. I, I think, um, when I just speak personally, it's important for me as a white man to recognize the implications of white privilege. You know, it's easy to decry the bigotry of the bigots. Mm. But it's easy for me as a white liberal to look into my heart and I see there are no racism, no homophobia, no bias, and absolve myself of history. But we are born into this <coughs> narrative. This is our history. It's not a segregated history. We're not born guilty, but we're born responsible. And I think how that responsibility is reflected in our curriculum is terribly important. And one final thought, um, perhaps, is that our, our, our conference looks to the common good and the solidarity that, uh, that is at the heart of it. And it's easy to think, well, the common good speaks of equality. And then how can we speak then of implicit bias? But at the heart of, of the common good, the critical question is whose equal dignity is unequally denied? Whose equal rights are unequally threatened? Who is missing from the table of deliberation? If there is to be a common good, policy has to look at those who are rendered systematically vulnerable, excluded, whose voices are silenced. And I think from a faith perspective, I've more and more come to believe that the center of the church is always at the margins. The place of hope is often those who have, whose lives have been a history of resistance. And my sense, if there is slavery is the original sin, this is an original blessing which someone like myself can really learn from. Uh, I teach at our Jesuit school at Berkeley, and for years we have had an association with St. Patrick's Parish, an African-American growing Hispanic parish. And I asked the elders there, what should I say? Uh, and they told me when I was going to speak on why, they simply listen to us, listen to us. And I think, as you said, Brett, this sense of, uh, uh, in Africa, where I've worked quite a bit, uh, they say, we need a chief with large ears. That is, someone who has the ability, a church with large ears, that can listen. Uh, and I think that's where we begin. Large ears, I love that. <laughs> My, my small thing I'll put in is to only say when we're thinking about teaching students, um, we're teaching students who are going to go on to be leaders in this community. Uh, one of the ideas that comes up from the Jesuit tradition is actually this idea of eloquentia perfecta and this idea of, and I'm going to read it just so I make sure I say it right, the right reason expressed effectively, responsibly, and gracefully. Now, in the context of thinking about our different candidates, we think about what happens when people are probably not being as deliberate in their, their, their critical thinking and how they're responding and how they're addressing these large audiences. So I think this is, a, this is definitely a great idea to keep with us as we're thinking about how to 
best prepare our students to think about how others are speaking and how they'll speak in the future as well. I have a social media question for you, just, I mean, just <laughs> looping back, because it's been such a, you know, undercurrent of the, I know we're wrapping up. Um, but what is your take? I mean, I know that a lot of your research is kind of focused around the role of the social media and language. And we, we've been hearing the terms, we're talking about implicit bias and explicit bias. And I think the role of social media is somewhere kind of in between because people can stay hidden, but say, you know, really um, horrible things. And so my question for you is, you know, how do you, um, from, the, from your research, how do you um, approach the role of the social media and the emerging, um, you know, what might be emerging as it relates to um, individuals and their biases and social media as um, a conduit? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think maybe it was uh, Tony who mentioned the idea that with a big part of social media is this idea that we're communicating these experiences, right, as we do with a lot of writing. And so I, I think um, in thinking about the idea that with all these different media, we're beginning to see different experiences of different populations and the fact that, I'm all reiterating what Tony said, the fact that we're finally now seeing, you know, people of color, you know, in situations where the 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 circumstances are very well laid out that all these questions of like, well, was this person doing this? Was this person mm -hmm. doing this? We're able to see it happen in our, in our news feed. Mm -hmm. I think the question of bias is a difficult one because, you know, with the algorithms that sometimes happen in our timelines and such, sometimes we have this bias that we might not be aware of just because, you know, we maintain uh, a network with certain friends who happen to post more, so we tend to see more of these. So it's easy for a lot of us to say, well, none of my friends follow Trump, so apparently, I, you know, it's a clear landslide. You can talk to somebody else who has a lot of Trump fans, and they're like, oh, Hitler's going down, Benghazi this, Benghazi that. So that is that is this difficult situation where so much of this can seem to happen in vacuums if we're not mm -hmm. if we're not really paying attention to what others are saying too so I think that goes back to what um, what Bill was saying oftentimes keeping our ears open even if we're definitely not liking what we're hearing mm -hmm. that that's mm -hmm. a good way to be continually to grapple with and negotiate those opposing ideologies I want to ask you, but I think this is a question for students. I just, I'm curious on like how the students are um, absorbing all the social media and like what conversations maybe you have with your students about it since you're the expert. <laughs> 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 or should we just wait until Q&A? I think we could do open up the Q&A. I think we open up the Q&A. Um, We're in Silicon Valley. I don't want to be claim myself as a so social media expert. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's some folks in the room even. So I'll just say before we transition to um, our question and answer as it relates um, to teaching research and service, and it, I, I won't repeat what I already stated about just the overwhelming importance and significance of cultural competence um, in all aspects of what we do, um, and really for individuals who have the ability to affect change. Um, and so that you can define that um, in whichever way is important. Um, which is whichever way is important to you. One of the things for me in my teaching, since I, I am in child studies and we do teach students who want to work with children in school and community settings. Um, and so they're the individuals who are gonna affect change. They're the individuals who are going to have an impact, positive or negative, on the lives of developing children. And so we really want to be able, and this is part of what um, Santa Clara is and part of the Ignatian Center with Arupe Partnerships. We really want to make sure that our, our students are engaged with the populations of students that they're going to be working with once they leave the university. So beyond making sure that they have community-based um, engagement opportunities, having those tough conversations. Mm -hmm. We have tough conversations all the time in my class and you could just cut mm -hmm. the air. It's so thick and you could see expressions. And I, I, I always say, you know, if we don't have these tough conversations, 
if you don't feel uncomfortable right now, something's not working. We, we, yeah. we just yeah. discussed that as a panel. Um, so it's okay to have the tough conversations. And Teresa's introduction, she said, you know, people don't talk about it, they don't want to talk about it. We have to talk about it. It's part of our responsibility as educators, as researchers, um, as seekers of knowledge, as lifelong learners. So, um, you know, the tough conversations are what pushes us forward. Did you want to add to that? Just, just to say thanks, Brett. Uh, I give my students, uh, the first quote I give them is from Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing, but you know, he says, I expected the racism and the hatred of the bigots, he says, but what breaks my heart is the appalling silence of the good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that yes. is the challenge, really, the, the mm -hmm. silence of the good. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we find voice, uh, both as citizens and citizens of faith? What a wonderful way to, to end our, um, our panel. So we're going to transition to a Q&A. We've got one microphone in the back. We have two microphones mm -hmm. in the back. So if anyone has questions, you can raise your hand, and one of our Ignatian Center staff will bring the mic to you. And so um, I think that's, I don't know if Julie's going to the mic, but I, I really do want to know what students are thinking about the, so, the role of social media in the, um, the election. Hi, Julie. Hi. I, um, I really appreciate the comment. I think it was Tony who made it about uh, holding candidates like Clinton accountable. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, really thinking about, you know, what, uh, you know, as some of the other panelists have said, what is some of the rhetoric that's being presented, but also um, what's going to happen, <clears throat> what's going to happen post-election day. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I, I wonder if you guys have thoughts about, I, I think, I understand why it's very powerful for us to be thinking about uh, presidential electoral politics and why it captures our imagination. Um, and at the same time, I wonder if you guys have thoughts about the limits of thinking of politics only as framed as electoral politics and or presidential electoral politics, so that it presents us with like, oh, there's choice A and choice B, right. as if there's no other possibilities outside of these choices. Um, so, um, so yeah, I just wonder if you have thoughts about that. Oof, there's a lot there. Um, well, it's, it's been said. Uh, in the midst of, of the so-called mainstream civil rights movement, right, of the 50s and 60s. Again, we can argue about the temporality of the movement, but it's been said that uh, laws can be passed, right, um, executive orders can be issued, but uh, it's very difficult to legislate people's feelings, right? So in terms of who might become president and policies they may enact, what is going to be the connection to people's everyday lives, right? Is that alt-right going to then change their minds about President Obama and his legacy? Is police brutality going to simply end because there's a Democrat in the White House? Um, we can't say that that's going to be the case, right? So I think it's a matter of young people and old people continuing to protest in whatever way possible they, they deem appropriate, through art, through literature, through literal sit-ins, mm -hmm. through marches, this has to continue. And we've seen the decimation of specifically black communities, right, across the country continue under democratic presidents. We have seen that exactly. happen. Exactly, exactly, right? yeah. So the challenge then is for even those who may have voted for a particular candidate the challenge is to keep that pressure on, right, in any way that you see fit. And that's the very nature of protest, to carry out a protest the way that you see it as being fitting, right, and, and possibly mm -hmm. effective. Yeah, there, there's that saying, uh, if the people lead, the leaders will follow. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think very important, again, to keep up that pressure mm -hmm. um, and, and beyond elections. Yes.
Um, this has a little bit to do um, with the same thing about holding our candidates accountable. Oh, we s you spoke a little bit about um, how the candidates are addressing the African American vote um, and those similar things. And I was wondering what are your views and what are the implications of speaking about other racial and ethnic and religious minorities in that same way, mm -hmm. speaking of the Hispanic vote, the Asian vote, the Muslim or Catholic or Christian vote. Um, as just votes, and how can we ensure that us as minorities, that our impact doesn't end after the ballot box, after November, whatever day it may be, um, and that we can continue to hold our candidates accountable? I'll just come quickly jump in and say, yeah, the Latino vote is definitely something that comes to be mentioned when, as we get closer and closer. The farther out, the, the more or less attention we can give to it. And, frame uh, Latinos as whatever they want to be framed as. Or, but yes, I think it's been spoken about this, the term of the sleeping giant is always how Latinos tend to be sort of framed. But that, that trope has really been criticized as being really anesthetizing, anesthetizing, try, try saying that five times fast, um, because it really puts out this idea that, well, you know, if they ever could get out and vote then, and so it really sets up sort of this false uh, logic then follows that, you know, then Latinos, if they ever did get out and vote, they would vote. And I think we are at this moment when I know a lot of Latinos who are definitely voting and they are not, they're the they're ones quickest to point out how un-Latino the people in the pictures holding up Latinos for Trump <laughs> signs tend to be. That's just my own insights from my own social network vacuum that I see. I'm interested in knowing what your thoughts are mm -hmm. um, like what do you <laughs> what do you think? Sorry, um, it's because they don't care about the subject, and I feel like the view should be that. We care, all of us, whatever um, our views or our backgrounds, do care very much. But the problem is, is well, a problem might be in how um, we believe that our single vote is not representative of, um, of, of how we are a part of our communities and that we have no impact. And so that's something that needs to be changed from the inside out, not only the outside in, and certain leaders telling certain people to go out and vote. I just I think that's uh, that's really a wonderful remark, and uh, the question of systemic racism is is really part of a larger systemic in, in set of inequities in in our country. Uh, certainly, the problems of campaign finance, where corporations are treated as individuals, and and you could address this better than I. But the profound distortion of information. Uh, uh, and, and really something that cuts to the heart of a deliberative democracy, of our capacity not just to vote, but to have a voice, I think is truly being threatened. Uh, and, and it is a question, I think, as much as we speak of politics, we also have to leave room for prophecy, you know, for those voices that can really summon us from the margins and raise the kind of questions just as, as you have. Others? There's a question right here. First of all, thank you so much for the panel. And I had a question maybe for the entire panel about this question of solidarity. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we talk a lot about solidarity and in this campaign, I'm wondering what your thoughts are, how solidarity is working, um, if it is, and the limits to it. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking particularly of a moment um, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement um, when a, a man who was Indian um, was assaulted by police and his spine was severed mm -hmm. in Alabama. And as soon as the event happened, Hindu American associations, South Asian associations, you know, blasted, of course, the police. Mm -hmm. um, but the question actually was that he was mistaken for a black man, and that was why he was actually assaulted. He was, you know, called to. And the silence around that, 
from the South Asian community was appalling in your language, right? And so what are the limits to solidarity as educators, but also in this election? And how do you see this kind of shaping out? And I think it's related to questions of social media, and I think also questions of, you know, how do we feel comfortable, do we feel threatened um, to feel solidarity and things like that. So. Yeah, I think that, I mean, we all could say, you know, think of, think of where we were eight years ago when we were all very enthusiastic about, um, or some of us may be enthusiastic about the um, Obama campaign, and um, he ran on, was it change, hope? What was Obama's um, hope and change? Change we can believe in. Um, and so I think that we've got a lot of work to do. We've become really polarized. And it's really unfortunate. I was speaking to somebody recently. Um, I just came back from my husband's 30 year high school reunion, and to see. You know, everybody who graduated from high school in 86, I'm dating, well, I'm not dating myself, I'm dating my husband. Um, <laughs> but just like the music, it was all kinds of music and everybody was dancing and celebrating. It didn't matter what color you were. I mean, there weren't pockets of, of individuals. And I just, you know, stood there and I thought, gosh, times were really good, you know, despite the fact that it was, you know, 86 and not that far removed um, technically from the civil rights movement. And I think about my African-American children today growing up in less than 3% Santa Clara County. And I feel, you know, yeah, how do we address issues of solidarity? Um, and I think that You know, there's there's certainly many approaches, and there's many ways in which we can, you know, try to to move towards um, becoming um, unified. But I think that there's a lot of work to do. But with that said, I think within communities there is a sense of solidarity. But but we need to really try to work towards bridging. And I think a lot of the rhetoric from the campaign has has really. Um, what's the right word I'm looking for, exacerbated mm -hmm. the whole issue, and, and um, it's disheartening. Mm -hmm. And so part of our role um, with the, the Racial and Ethnic Justice Faculty Collaborative is to talk about these issues in our, our, our quarterly um, um, seminar groups and how do we move towards mm -hmm. solidarity specifically in relationships. Um, to racial and ethnic justice. I think there's there's many layers and there's not one Solution, I think one one way as faculty we can contribute to Possibly growing increasing that solidarity is through teaching our courses that deal directly with the history of race and racism mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. the history of the process of race making mm -hmm. right racialization and so we've seen in this particular campaign, um, the process of race making touched so many yeah, different certainly. groups. Right. So it's there for us to see. And I think, again, mm -hmm. one, one way that we can, as, as faculty, um, you know, address that particular absence, maybe, mm -hmm. right, or lack of presence mm -hmm. of solidarity across mm -hmm. these constructed lines mm -hmm. of race and ethnicity is to educate our students and be real with them right and show them the history the process mm -hmm. of of race making right if your yeah. if your grandfather came from ireland in 1910 he wasn't necessarily considered to be a white person right mm -hmm. so students need to understand mm -hmm. that broader spectrum of the process of race making and I think I'd only add the, the importance, too, if you don't feel like you're specifically someone who's been minoritized or racialized, too, the idea of, you know, being an ally and what that all entails, mm -hmm. because I think that speaks to what, what uh, Bill mentioned with regard to the silence, right? Are you going to be someone who's going to be, you know, raising your voice when you see something that doesn't, that doesn't feel right or feel making those steps forward towards solidarity we want to? And I mean, that's one of the ironies that solidarities divide us as well. 
And uh, I was just thinking of um, something Colonel, Colonel West said, let me just he says, the black freedom struggle, he says, must be understood not as an affair of skin pigmentation and racial phenotype, but rather as a matter of ethical principles and wise politics. Mm -hmm. and, and I think an understanding of solidarity and the common good that, that is based on our common humanity. And, and I think the question is there, I, I think of something Pope Francis said with, uh, at Lampedusa, uh, you know, seeing how many African migrants have died, and he said, you know, have we lost the ability to weep? Have we lost the ability to weep, to feel compassion? And, which is not pity, that's what the proud give to the poor, but literally entering into the suffering of, of another. I think that's a basis of solidarity that extends beyond uh, those solidarities that truly can divide us. Uh, There's a hand. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Although Hillary's choice of the word deplorables was really very unfortunate, and although I think her percentage, I think or hope her percentages were way off to say that half of Trump supporters were a basket of deplorables, I do worry a lot, and it really affects my ability to hope, that there are so many people, and on social media, and when you see news clips of his rallies, and you hear people, you know, when applauding wildly when he suggests building a wall between the U.S. and Mexico, or banning all Muslims, or stop and frisk, or all the other horrific things he said. So my question is, what do we do about the people who might be in the really unfortunately named basket of deplorables, but let me call it instead, the people who maybe aren't going to go to college, haven't gone to college, right. who somehow have developed these attitudes of racism and xenophobia, who reject mm -hmm. the very premise that there's either structural racism or implicit bias. Mm -hmm. And as teachers, we think and hope that with college students, many of them already come in not necessarily feeling that way about the world, but some of them may, and we hope that their encounters with faculty and fellow students and staff mm -hmm. will change that. But what about all the people who aren't going to ever go to college? Mm -hmm. And how do we change their hearts and minds as citizens? <laughs> um, I mean, it's a great question, and, and I think the um, you know, legacy of nonviolent resistance seeks uh, the conversion of, of the enemy. Some of the studies I've seen, and I can I defer to, to others here, say that the strongest support for Trump has come from those who are racially isolated. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's something I think that, that uh, is so important. Uh, you know, Years ago, uh, wearing my political header, Machiavelli said that uh, those who desire to deceive will always find those who desire to be deceived. Mm -hmm. And I think a willing deception based on fear and hatred is, is a large part of what uh, is, is creating this kind of inward-looking solidarity mm -hmm. of fear. And, and how is that broken? I, I think religious voices, prophetic voices, mm -hmm. have a terribly important role to play here. Uh, and it's one, as Brian Massengill has said, sadly that the Catholic Church has been delinquent in. So I, I really am so grateful that we've made a beginning uh, today. I would reiterate the significance, the importance, right, of education. Um, and it isn't just, and I'll add that when we kind of, we've tended to characterize Trump supporters in particular ways, I think. Mm -hmm. And a useful tool for those of us who are interested in kind of stemming the tide of that sort of mm. <laughs> explicit racism is to recognize that racism exists in this country on so many different levels. I mean, we're talking about CEOs, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about governors, police chiefs, all sorts of people in all different facets of American life. And so uh, it, it it gives me hope to remind myself that our country is mm -hmm. very young mm -hmm. and this is kind mm -hmm. of a new project if we think mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the longer history of humanity, right? So that we really do have a lot of time to work at this, <laughs> uh, and, right? right. So, so there's still a lot of time, but we have to be consistent in our work and, and again for me, mm -hmm. education is, is, is one tactic, mm -hmm. right, to get at that. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you all very much for your um, dialogue, for your reflections, and for the ways in which you've invited all of us, as well as our um, elected, uh, those who are kind of standing for um, the presidential office to um, help us to consider all that is at stake for racial and ethnic justice for our communities in our hearts and in our um, nation and in our world. So thank you very much for your thoughtful reflections and challenge today. Um, in, in um, we had many um, kind of citations um, throughout, but I share one that Pope Francis um, puts forth that society as a whole, so that is all of us and the state in particular, so in our particular way, our, our government leaders are obliged to defend and promote the common good. And as we ask, okay, what, is, what does solidarity really mean? I think I hope over the course of the next several years, but you know, into, um, into kind of the, the long arc ahead, we'll continue to wrestle with that question of, is there a common good in our common home and what constitutes the common good to hold that before us as a, as a call. Um, a few announcements. First, there's evaluations at your seat. So this is a new venture for us within this kind of next generation of the Bannon Institute. We really value your feedback. So if you can take a minute to complete your evaluation um, or there's gonna be an electronic evaluation sent to you by email too. So if that's an easier way for you to give us feedback, we appreciate it in any form. Um, and then as I had mentioned, today's event is part of a four part series exploring what's at stake for the common good in 2016. So each week in October, we'll be hosting in this room um, one component of this series. So this coming week on Tuesday, October 11th at four o'clock, we'll feature a professor.